does a lot of charity work, uh, does floral arrangement. He's just a trem- he's really a funny guy. But boy, did he he stir up a bunch of ladies in Barrington, a very affluent community. Folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is a special edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, coming to you live on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live, download our free app, and stream all of our live local shows, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. And can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today because I get to bring in the Dow father of bluegrass not the father of bluegrass but the Dow father of bluegrass a guy that i am spiritually connected to forever because of our cultivation of the Dow, seeking our true nature uh trying to manage our ego in a very materialistic western world peter Mm -hmm. rowan welcome back to the jake feinberg show great to be back with you jake (laughs) Tell Wonderful. Me my, tell me, my friend, I, can you talk to the audience about uh, even a time this year when you struggled managing your ego and how the Tao helped bring peace to you? Well, for one thing, the Tao is just our true nature, so it never stops being Tao. And uh, all we have to do is cultivate the way of resting, right? resting in the Tao of our true nature, the way of our true nature. But, uh, yeah, on this recent road trip, I began to lose patience a little bit with uh, United Airlines, <laughs> the continued d- delays, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, that, yeah. and, and strange clerks. You know, traveling in Europe, everybody's so accommodating. Come back to the U.S., and everybody is like, oh, no, you can't carry the guitar on. And no, you, know, you have to buy a seat for it. And, you know, doing all that. The same old stuff. And um, after so many years of being on the road, I've been on the road for 50 years, and it just seems like to, you know, to be fighting these same old arguments. And uh, but that that side never changes. I don't know in the Tao, uh, what we call that, maybe the worldly way. Uh, in Buddhism, we call it uh, samsara, our our cyclic reaction to the world of. Uh, seemingly chaos, but you know, if anything, on this last trip, being in Venice and coming to Florida and now being in Arizona, it was like, you know, you don't have all your your uh, uh, support paraphernalia. Your don't have your regular. I don't have my regular schedule. I don't didn't bring any drums and bells, and it was just me and my guitar and my suitcases <laughs> and and meeting great friends along the way sure. that especially get down here in Arizona. That's very restorative because, you know, I think uh, the music is one way to uh, fi- uh, a common language between the audience and the listener in, in spiritual intention. And it helps me kind of feel reconnected to what I am becoming familiar with, which more and more is the our true nature and that you know i think it, it, basically the word is relax <laughs> yeah i don't, don't want to i mean but this you know first of all have you have you officially received the Tao in a ceremony no i haven't no but i my path has been more along the lines of a uh, uh the, the empowerments received in the tibetan buddhist sure uh, sure uh, t- tradition, but no, there's a ceremony of the Tao. Well, actually, I mean, it, I would, I would, uh, just because I would love to have you come to the Holy House in Tucson because I received the the ceremony and about five years ago, and uh, without getting into uh, specifics, it fundamentally, um, well, basically, you you write your personal information on an index card, and uh, during the ceremony itself. Uh, that card is actually burned. You light it on fire, and that signifies uh-huh. signifies the end of a chapter of your previous life and the beginning of a new chapter. And I think that for you, somebody who's already written about this, have, has infused the Tao into bluegrass music, I, I mean, I think you are incredibly... I think you are ready to receive the. There's a receiving ceremony. You receive the Tao, wow. and, and fundamentally, I mean, Peter, this happened 
before I even met you that first time a couple years ago. I mean, it fundamentally changed my whole being. And the coolest thing is I can't explain any of it. Okay. Yeah. So it's all there yeah. amidst the chaos. I wonder though, I want to ask you this question. I was just talking to, I just was doing Tai Chi. I, I don't do this a lot, but I was in the park this morning doing Tai Chi uh, in honor of, of talking to the Dow of the Dow father of bluegrass, Peter Rowan. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And I wonder, do you think that the Tao, that we are better equipped to, to have the Tao living in this berserko capitalistic Western society, uh, as opposed to going to a place like Japan where they live it? Maybe it seems like you would be more in touch because, you know, they really live, they live the Tao. It's a way of life in these Asian Well, countries. yeah, I, I do seek those places as support, but I don't know, in the last 10 years, I've since my last trip to, to Japan and the Himalayas, I I just feel like the work is here, and uh, there's only one way to do the work. In the end, I've decided you can't. You just have to go 100. Um, percent And um, and that I think has been the most helpful thing is the commitment that uh, the inner work and the outer work. As long as those motivations are lined up in the same way, then it's a spiritual adventure spiritual journey no matter where you are or how you are and they also say that in the west the contract this materialistic society is such a contrast to the what we imagine is our best side our Tao side it the contrast is even stronger so it highlights the spiritual uh, or or it's, it's in a strange way supportive of and highlights the spiritual journey um, because we feel so up against it sometimes in the West. I, I love I love your perspective. I really am amazed that uh, uh, I just I'm curious. I mean, you've always struck me as a cosmic character, but I mean, you you could honestly say that you started to tap into Eastern spirituality at what point in your life? Okay, I was a bluegrass boy. In Nashville, Tennessee, in 1963, I was 22 or 3, 23, going to be 24, I think. Um, uh, and uh, there was a lot of time in Nashville. Bill Monroe at the time was only working on the weekends at the Grand Old Opry, and I didn't, I didn't know how, you know, how his whole historic. Uh, development and success as it's seen in the light of being a country music icon when bluegrass was on the charts you know was had number one songs like blue moon of kentucky bill was a he was a major star and um um you know i had no reference points uh at that time except a kind of like a uh, I wouldn't know how to say it. It was unformed, unnamed, and uh, mm. I kept a notebook. And the pages in my notebook were very small because I carried it in my back pocket. <laughs> and it, it's the basis of my sort of musical biography that I'm writing. But because the pages are small, I had to write very cryptic, um, you know, sort of notes and impressions of my life down there in Nashville in the segregated South and uh, working on the Grand Old Opry and, you know, uh, what my life was as a sort of nebulous, uh, early 20s kind of guy from the North, being a Yankee, you know, so I, I was sort of jotting down my impressions and perspectives on things. And, uh, and um, that was the, you know, I'd already started keeping notebooks. And, and I realized looking back, it's mostly it's mostly uh, notes of spiritual longing, you know, and everybody has that. And I think that's what the songs, songs be become that. And, um, uh, or our songs are emanations or, you know, glimpses of stuff that, you know, we remark upon. Now we're just talking to someone this morning here up in Phoenix about segregated society and, and then, you got to the South and you realize that it, it wasn't just a simple battle. And of course, it's, yes, absolutely necessary to have the, 
legislative backup that says, hey, <laughs> we, this is not right. right, you know? right. But, but, but the way people lived in the South was an accommodation to everything, especially the black people. They didn't carry a big sign around. I mean, oh, it, it, you could say Uncle Tom, but it wasn't really that. It was more they were living in, in the now, sort of in a sense, in a Taoist way through a Christian background of forgiveness and you know all the spiritual virtues that the inner nature um, has to project on the world are all paths to cultivation you know there may be faster paths so-called or there may be more slower um, more expansive paths to our inner nature to the to the seeing that the mirror image of our inner world is the outer world we perceive and how we perceive it well, anyway, Nashville was a very sort of boring place at that time, and uh, being on the Grand Ole Opry was a totally unique experience and meeting the, the people who were the foundations of American country music. And uh, I walked into a bookstore one day and uh, struck up a conversation. The man in the bookstore was not really a bookstore dealer. He was a, dealing in artifacts and antiques from uh, – the destruction of some of the older architectural places in Nashville. And he had a few pillars and banisters and uh, mantelpieces. And he had a, a bookshelf. And on the bookshelf was about four or five books. It was Proust and a book called The Autobiography of a Yogi. Oh, I love it. By, by Paramsana Yogananda. So mm -hmm. that was the first, first, uh, first sort of, uh, you know, book I opened, it was like, well, there's a whole world going on here. What does all this mean, you know? And that led me to reading, you know, everything I could find. <laughs> Basically, uh, studying Aristotle with a teacher uh, back up in Boston. And Aristotle, and what what they were looking for in, in, in just the illumi illumination of the soul, as I speak in that language, Gnosticism, uh, to become aware of one's true nature, I started to see that there was a connection with all of that. And uh, but I, you know, it was all un, unformed and uh, um, unnamed. Did you? Did you? Do you have a? Uh, I would love if you. I don't do a lot of reading as far as. Do you have any historical? Uh, readings of the history of the Tao that you could hit me to. I would just would love to read some about it if you if you have it. Oh, I think you know the Tao Te Ching that they've. Uh, I mean the the Tao Te Ching. You know that's probably the, the best companion if you, volume. It's it's often the um, uh, um, uh, commentaries that are so interesting, and I would say Chuang Tzu. The uh, James Leg made a transi translation for uh, um, um, what was it? The, it was a series, but James Leg did a nice uh, translation of Chuang Tzu, and Chuang Tzu was. Still there. I think we've lost Mr. Rowan. We'll try to regain reception momentarily. Situations where, where children have been smashed their car in the parking lot and apprehended and not even punished. So if, if you can't get any kind of backup at all, you, you, you have nowhere to go. So, but the real, my point in all this is, and the headline in the story is, are terrible schools unconstitutional? off there i just you know i was uh, here's what i want to because you were talking about james leg is that what two yeah, james, the, the chuang su dialogues chuang su chuang c-h-u-a-n-g-t-z-u chuang su who was uh lao tzu's student or companion i got it right here james leg all right. Well, let me ask you. Here's Peter. Here, here's the. You know, we have our true nature, and then we have our karmic nature, which is from our previous life. And I often struggle with this a lot in my cultivation. Is that I have my habitual nature, which tends to be uh, longing for um, 
not really being able to appreciate the moment, um, not being satisfied, uh, always needing uh, some sort of... <clears throat> uh, um, I, I mean, maybe, pacification. <laughs> maybe, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. All we, and you know, and and, and so I'm curious with you, uh, what in, what in your life? Because uh, ultimately, you work when you cultivate that that stuff. Uh, you you, you it, it, the your karmic nature gets less shrouded, and more clear. And I was wondering if you could talk about <clears throat> something that, I mean, as you cultivate your true nature. Uh, what what your karmic nature reveals to you about your previous who previous life and yeah what that's you... that's a yeah definitely a phase of uh, entering the path where I mean my, really most of the music and poetry comes from that uh, when the higher spiritual light is shown upon one's own so called karmic nature but really there is um, I mean that's where the story comes from. That's the story, and you're interested in everybody's stories, and that's that's the world of cause and effect, right? <laughs> it's the world of appearances. Yeah, yeah. But the world of appearances can be seen from the ultimate nature. That's that's the great happy joy secret of the whole thing is that there is no karmic nature that has to be dealt with as as a whole. I think the essential illusion is that we are somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, but that's that's the, that's the whole story. That's history. That's everything. Because that that is what is going on in illusion, is subject and object and conflicts between desire and you know aversion to I don't want that. I want that. It's like we don't want to give that up. We call that ego. You know, you could say karmic nature, but it's not really a nature. The only nature is the true nature. The rest are all, it's like dust on the mirror. Right. That's the best way. I, I think it describes it the best. But it's just dust on the mirror. And then there's the story, and then there's the spiritual journey story, which is how I wiped my mirror clean. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. You know. Less shreds. And, then in, yeah, and in the end, you know, the, the mirror is still the mirror, and any dust that falls on it is just seen more for what it is rather than as like this other, other thing, the ego. You know, because the ego doesn't really have an existence, but it, as a culmination of, of, of the five senses, uh, we grasp at that which appears the most real, and if it involves food and clothing, especially, that's like a huge attachment. How do and you, I think music, yeah. music kind of is a, sorry, uh, that music is the, uh, um, is a kind of a, yeah, it's a fresh, uh, a, a fresh dip in the river, you know, kind of a cleansing, you know, for the moment. From the moment, it can be uh, transcendent, and some people can take it home and suddenly apply something to their lives that we call an inspiration. Talking to Peter Rowan here live on Power Talk. Such a treat to reconnect with Peter. He came down to um, Sao Rita a couple of years ago, played a solo concert, made it look effortless. Uh, and uh, we had a ball hanging out. Peter, can you, you know, one thing I've been talking to cats about a lot lately, and I, I think that I'd like to, you know, talk to you about it is just, did you have run ins and encounters with uh, the beat poets, uh, specifically Kerouac, uh, Ginsburg, or maybe even cats like Lord Buckley? Because, like, when I talked to Marty Ballin from Jefferson Airplane, I mean, Ballin basically yeah. said, like, when he was 14, he, he would go down into his parents' basement. Uh, this was a rare occasion, but I think it was maybe his uh -huh. mom, mom's birthday or something. And Lord Buckley was riffing poetry with a with a black jazz trio or quartet in the background. Uh, it's just like mind blowing stuff. And I just we talked we've talked before about you know those quiet clubs in Boston with maybe some conga players and a saxophone. But I just I'm curious about <clears throat> your personal interaction with the beat poets and and their effect yeah. on you. Well, yes. Um... There were two, um, and I met them both about the same time in in the seventies. And one was uh, Bob Creeley, hmm. a, a minimalist poet uh, on the periphery of the so-called beats, um, but uh, you know, admired by all of those folks. And um, of course, Allen Ginsberg. I got to know Allen and. 
he honored me with uh, some recognition, and uh, um, I played music for him at some of his readings. And um, one, uh, and by way of thanks, he wrote a page for me of meet the old master meets the young student muse, and I was, you know, flattered. I thought it was me was directed to me, and it was a spontaneous poem. And, um, uh, you know, Alan was, you know, transsexual, and and I didn't know where to go with all that. I mean, he never came on to me. We met on, I think, a much higher level. He was also a student of Tibetan Buddhism. In other words, the the often cited um, possibility of enlightenment within one's lifetime. Uh, but then, you know, the question of what is a lifetime, a, a real lifetime, is goes beyond death into the next physical manifestation. Uh, so we had a philosophical basis for uh, uniting our energy. So I played music for him up at the Naropa Institute in Colorado, which was started by a Tibetan uh, Lama Chogyam Trungpa. And he had come over... He had escaped from Tibet as a young Tulku, reincarnated uh, teacher, who's you know would go through the education process, but but had like a storehouse of of, of uh, enlightened energy from previous lifetimes and practice that had enabled him to realize a lot of the the true nature. So he was very charismatic, and Alan became his student, and I studied with him too, uh, and. Um, Trungpa said one fabulous thing, and uh, I think this is applicable to the dialogues of Chuang Tzu and Lao Tzu. When as a, a student asked Trungpa, uh, how does one know when one is realizing one's true nature? And he said, uh, I, I just may be a little noisy here. It's all right. Um somebody walking by with a tray of a, a, a big cart of salads. I'm in the I'm in the musical instrument museum. Oh, you're in the mim right now. What a treat. Yeah, I, no, I played cool. here last night. What I you, played here last night. What did he say? What did what did what what, what, what did he say to that response? <laughs> <laughs> How do we know where we are at, you know? Wow. And uh, he said uh you know, curiously, when one reaches the throne of enlightenment, there is no one there to crown. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that pretty much nail. But you know, I just I'm looking up in Google here, uh, Ginsburg, June twenty eighth, nineteen seventy six, class on spontaneous poetics at Naropa Institute. Yes. I mean, yes. Is, is that? Does that sound about right? Seventy six. Oh yeah, yeah. That's when I was there, and I did some teaching uh, in the more uh, uh, what would you call it? <laughs> um, yeah, I just did some, a songwriting teaching class there for one week, a seminar. But you know, Ann Waldman was there, and she was she's always been a, a, an inspiration. Um, uh, Jack, uh, who was Holm H O L M E S, that a Dutch poet was there. They were all the. the uh, Alan was in charge of the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics. I love it. And so he brought in as many of the people from that beat generation, including William Burroughs, who I spent time with. So, yeah, that was my contact uh, pretty much up at Naropa. Uh, you know, when people get back to their own scenes, they're very busy with their world that surrounds them. But uh, Alan was always... Every time I saw him, he'd, he'd, wherever it was, he'd give me his badge, the all access badge, and said, "No, wear this. You, you're here." <laughs> he, it was, you know, that that kind of. Um, I mean, it, let me just say that the recognition by people who are peers or um, leaders of, you know, the you know who have staked their lives on exploring new ground, and when somebody like that recognizes you it gives you a, some a sense of confidence you know in fact all the people that are confiding their stories in you you know what i mean you know it, it, it's like you want to honor 
what's behind the story and then what's behind that story and then you want to honor your true nature and uh, you know um, so that leads us on a further spiritual journey with the inspiration from um, these great folks and um, I would say that uh, um, you know, every from everyone from Bill Monroe uh, to Allen Ginsberg has, has been an influence on me in that I wasn't uh, born with a whole lot of self-confidence. And uh, to strike out on the journey with sort of unmarked, uh, uh, there was no uh, uh, there was no breadcrumbs to follow into this forest of, uh, um, of the unknown. So. When the older people, you know, whether they were, you know, if it's like a jazz bass player and you're trying to work up a song together for a gig that you'll never repeat, <laughs> but, you know, and he, he looks at you and gives you the nod, you know, yeah, he gives yeah. you the nod. It's kind of like, well, yeah, but I'm struggling, so yeah, thank you. But <laughs> over time, you know, over time, that kind of stuff kind of has an energy. And like, for instance, when Ralph Stanley recorded two of my songs, and then told me at a festival that he had done that. And when he said, yep, we recorded, and he had his own titles for the songs. Uh, um, uh, he, he said, we've recorded a, a drum beats on the watchtower, which is the opening line for a song that I titled Wild Geese Cry Again, which is from a poem from Du Fu, uh, the great Chinese poet in the 6th or 7th century, you know, back when Tibet was marauding China, you know, going sure, in there and sure. kicking butt, you know, and this was Du Fu's song in exile on the borderlands, you know, constantly, you know, with harassment by, you know, the armies of in, invading neighbors like the Mongols and Tibet, and before Tibet had Buddhism, you know, China had it, and uh, but they had the Tao, you know what I mean? The Tao who was cultivated and became a great influence on the Tibetan tradition, um, and to record a song like Wild Geese Cry Again or Drum Beats on the Watchtower, as Ralph Stanley so per- perfectly renamed it. <laughs> you know, Bluegrass is, you, you, you take the first image, that's the title. <laughs> now, the song The Walls of Time, you know, of the words, The Walls of Time, only appear in the song once. So that was a big innovation, and I brought that, you know, idea out of, in that song with Bill Monroe. And it was my idea that the walls of time were everything from kind of an Emily Bronte uh, Gothicism to Bill Monroe's music itself, you know. And so working with masters and meeting masters and 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 for somebody to say, hey, that's pretty good, boy. When you're you know accompanying a fiddle player who's obviously you know twice your age and putting it down, and, and they say that's right, you know, that's like wow. You know, so I, I sought these uh, people of an older generation. You know, and Alan gives me Ginsburg giving me his all access pass at somewhere. That was another way of, you know, what I mean, it's like that subtle kind of thing, saying you're you're on the path. You, you know, you're you, you're gonna you're gonna do it. The first person that ever said anything to me along that lines was a, a Jamaican woman who was a maid at. Um, at a, um, at a at a family near where I grew up, and my parents used to go up there for you know afternoon cocktails or whatever. And um, they would always send me to the kitchen, and uh, and I, I was only four or five years old, and you know felt very insecure. But my parents were, you know, and my first brother was to, was going to be born that next year, and I was like sort of losing the prime place in my life <laughs> as the only boy, you know. And they they send me they would send me to the kitchen and Viola would pour me a big glass of milk and um uh, and a uh, um uh give me a cookie she had baked and I just remember and she wore a starched white uniform. Uh and she was Jamaican and she was living up in the New England area as a as a, a domestic um, you know, uh, helper. And she her skin was so dark as to be almost uh, had a purple sheen on it, and I'll never forget because that was the first person of color I ever met, and uh, it was four or five, and I just remember she put her hand on on my shoulder and looked at me with this huge, beautiful Christian 
wonderful, compassionate smile. He says, Peter, child, you're all right. You know, when you hear that from an adult, when you're a young and highly confused child, and, and, and she cut through, you know. And when I, when I went to Jamaica to record all the songs on Reggabilly, and when I did Awake Me in the New World, she was very much in my mind. In fact, I wrote about her in Caribbean Woman. Um, that song, just the slightest touch of, of, a, of a encouragement, you know, and I think that that, that touch of encouragement, that that look, that thing, that's probably been the more, one of the most most sustaining things in my life, and and enables me to have the courage to work with people that were beyond my age and experience, and not be uh, ashamed. In fact, be enthusiastic to enter into a world that I had no idea what it was. And take from it what I could because I had nothing to defend. You know, I didn't feel a sense of defense. But that all began with uh, Viola, you know, <laughs> giving me a glass of milk and a cookie and saying, Gita man, Gita child, you know, you're all right, child. That's what she said. You're all right, child. You know, because she saw the nervousness of a young kid just in the world for four or five years and uh, and. So that memory has stayed with me, and I think that that's been a motif in my life. Yeah, no, I dig. I, I, I that that sense of security from a from a, coming from somebody who doesn't know you at all can see right into your soul, and uh, and really, right, you know, and, and really give and give you some peace when you are not getting that from people you're supposed to get it from, like your mo- mother and father. Um, right, you know, who who are going through their own changes? Yes. Right. I mean, you know, it's just like uh, I, I mean, there's just so many things that you, I mean, you're. I think you probably can come up with some lyrics to a song just off the first 32 minutes of our conversation. I mean, you've been waxing poetic here. Also, yeah. the, that that uh, that Mim restaurant is five star. I, I mean, it's a phenomenal. There's a lot of good food in there. Don't miss out on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't, no, yo, tell me, tell me. Um, I, Peter, I've been. Uh, could you talk about? I mean, it's you've had a lot of lot of demarcation points in your career, but I just wanted to know uh, when you felt your ears grew the most. I mean, to everybody that I talk to, it really, if you're playing melodic music, if you're playing spiritual music, it's really about listening, and your ears can't be locked and. Every, you know, when when did your ears grow the most? Was there a point in time? Was was it with Bill Monroe? Was it when when did your ears grow the most as a musician? It might have been the gig last night at the Men's Museum. <laughs> <laughs> but, but let me just uh, yeah. just finish up with one one sure. anecdote. Sure, go ahead. That, you know, it was Ram Dass himself who uh, told me in a in a spontaneous take on my enthusiasm for things up at a retreat we were on with the, the wonderful Kalu Rinpoche from Tibet. And he said, you know, if you live in America, at, at, at some point you're going to have to deal with the race issue. And I was like, wow, you know, I really hadn't thought about that at all. So that opened a dimension in my experience to have these memories of, of, um, for instance, Viola, because I began to search that way. I mean, Ram Dass pretty incisive. He can get in there. And I would say then, in answer to when did my ears open, well, when I first saw Chuck Berry live uh, when I was 14 years old, he was probably, so he's, I think he's, 10 or 15 years older than I. So he was in his mid-20s. He hadn't fallen prey to the political and racial stuff that got him for a while. And um, when I saw Chuck Berry come out on stage with such ease and and, uh, gladness, uh, I mean, he was a performer, but he was a performer of the the time and also of his own, of his higher nature as a came through his poetry and guitar playing and dancing. It was like, hey, kids, this is what this is what life really is, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And when I saw Chuck get up there and grinning in his 
green tuxedo and black string tie and go, hey, hey, this is my foolishness suit. <laughs> you know, and he goes into the opening riff of uh, school days, and we just leapt out of our seats. You know, my mother had taken us over there. My nine-year-old brother, Chris, rushed the stage yelling, Chuck, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was that was an ear opener. and But at the time, it just felt like wonderful excitement, you know. But that was a major ear opener. And, I, you know, I, I began to, over time, you know, experiment with the different costumes and different that. And just, you know, it, it, the job of the musician in any way possible, you know, is to bring that idea of, of you know, inner excitement, that quiver of inspiration to people. You know, who pl- a picture I saw on the wall here at the Musical Instrument Museum was Earl Klug. Now, I was just in Honolulu, and um, I went to the library there and in Kailua, and I took out a couple of books on Hawaiian history and an Earl Klug CD. And I listened to it for a week during the storms when I was there. And at the end, the last day I was there, uh, or the day we, I was going to go in the studio, um, dawned clear. The storms had passed away. And I'd been listening to Earl Klug. And I immediately started writing a song with the Earl Klug influence. You know, my, my simplified version of it. Sure. But, you know, Earl Klug, he is a musical light. I wasn't even aware he was still in this world. But he is a, a, a fantastic uh, influence, I would say. Him and, you know, with a kind of Brazilian and jazz guitar. And he still just plays a straight classical guitar. But let me just finish up, Jake, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Here. Yeah, please, uh, go ahead. Um, I would say that uh, another, you know, looking at the racial kind of profile is like, I always loved the blues, and I always loved, ever since I heard Lightning Hopkins thought that it, it had a lot to say, you know, from Chuck Berry on down into the roots of it, Muddy Waters and people like that that I could hear, you know, he could hear at the old Club 47 in Cambridge. Uh, as it began to expand its boundaries from folk music to the, the, the roots of the roots. And uh, one day out in Berkeley, California, I was in a band C train, early 70s. And uh, just around the time we were, no, no, it was uh, before, well, yeah, no, it was probably late 69. And uh, we had a gig at a place called the uh, Freight and the Salvage. And John Lee Hooker, by himself was opening the show. And I think you'll appreciate this in the sense of the Tao. Uh, John Lee asked me to play his set with him. And, uh, wow. You know, I think that word has gotten around that there was this kid who played with Bill Monroe who was really interested in everybody's music. You know, sure, and sure. people do talk to each other, you know. They do. And he said, you know, I said, he said, I, would you come come up and play with me? And I, said, I like, I had been listening to John Lee's acoustic folk, folkways records, and uh, I think it was Vanguard or Verve, but but it was folk. He he had actually had big bands, like Big Joe Turner type bands, and was quite a star in the blues. And now this was folk music, and all I knew of him as an acoustic guitar player. So I got up there, and, and I had a Les Paul electric guitar that I was playing in the band C Train and uh, I was like okay now I'm presented with a dilemma here you know me you know sort of self-judging you know uh, undeserving and uh, un, 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 uh, uh, unauthentic you know my love of black music being as you know a white person with white identity which you know, uh, friends of mine had already adopted a whole black approach, and I, I just, I found that it was bluegrass that had the black music in it that I could relate to as my love for the acoustic guitar and, and all that. But it, behind it was, you know, hearing Lead Belly sing In the Pines and then hear Billing, Bill Monroe sing In the Pines and sing it with him on stage. That was my connection. My original connection was with listening to the music of Lead Belly. And, but you don't think of that when you're going through it. It's you're on to the next thing, right? So Absolutely, here I am yeah. at the end of that, That you know, five, uh, five. Uh, let's see, 
three years from being a bluegrass boy and um, being asked by John Lee Hooker to play his set with him at a club, and I'm in a rock and roll band, you know, that's going to close the show. And I'm, I mean, the conflict was, this is John Lee Hooker, and he's opening for this rock and roll band. This is like, that's totally wrong. <laughs> he should be the headliner, right? Yeah, definitely. So I, I got up. I got up. It's completely. I, I'm the complete unknown, you know. And I got up with him, and I stood there the whole set. And all I did was back him up. And he just kept looking at me with a twinkle in his eye for the whole 30 minutes. And I didn't, there were no, he, whatever solos were his fills and runs and everything. And uh, and I was like, I was too, I, you know, I, I, I think the greatest learning is when you're uncomfortable in that you have a con conflicting emotions about what's going on, but what's going on is still going on and you can't judge it. Right? No. And and you just look that gleam in John John Lee's eye and he's giving me the, the go ahead, you know? And and I'm like, Oh my God, this really is amazing, you know, <laughs> but you, you don't have time to think like that at that time, right? You're just in the moment. You're trying to play music with John Lee Hooker. And so for the last song in the set he gave me a solo. And I mean, this man schooled me. He gave me a solo. And I'd listen to his records, and I'd listen to his solos, and they were very, very simple and straightforward. Uh, they weren't fancy. You know what I mean? It was like, get down to the roots and boogie children. And this is before any of that phenomenon happened of John Lee as a pop star, you know, being recorded with Eric Clapton and everybody. Sure. And so he looks at me, and he says, take it. <laughs> Well, take it was I took that one note that I'd been playing the whole night and played the one note <laughs> as a solo. <laughs> and I think I, I might have, like, you know, slid off the note at the end of my solo. <laughs> and John Lee just, just said, that's right. <laughs> oh, man, that's <laughs> the, now, totally the Dow right there. That's the Dow. That is and the Dow. That think, is the I mean, you also, I mean... <laughs> I don't know. There would have been so much fluctuation of emotions on my end. I can't even believe you were in that situation, but then handling it with with no ego at all. I mean, that's he just kept looking at you and saying, "He got this guy's got it. This guy's got well, it." Well, no time for ego, but he was way more advanced to be in front of an audience than I. You know, but that's where I got the idea that you know, leaving into space was probably a good thing to do. <laughs> Not worry about the landing so much. Right, you know. Uh, so yeah, that I mean, I've been thinking a lot about that recently because my first time I ever played with professionals were black musicians. Uh, the other before that, I was in, when I was in college at Colgate University. I was a freshman, and Josh White came up and played. Wow. And the upperclassmen who knew that I played guitar and were sort of fans took me down backstage, and I was like backstage, you know. And they took me backstage and. I met a Josh White who had, had some terrible. Uh, you you should uh, talk to Josh White Jr. By the way, I would love to. Yeah, because he 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 knows the story. Uh, there was a you know major thing during the uh, McCarthy era. Then Josh got caught up in the middle of it and it destroyed him in a way professionally. He he had no credibility at, with the folk crowd, but he had already been a star. His music from the 1930s in South Carolina, some of the best blues recordings ever made i'll stand behind that uh so uh, josh white i sat down with josh and i played you know trouble in mind i played i played i played big bill brunsey to josh white's playing josh white and i because i knew brunsey and white from my listening had had played together they were contemporaries and so i knew uh trouble in mind um keys to the highway you know some uh brownie mcgee stuff that I'd learned from Sunday Terry and Brian McGee. And uh, that was Josh White again. You know, I was afraid that I would just be turned away at the door and as, you know, unequal and unable to do anything. So, I mean, I was, honestly was painfully, painfully uh, un, uh, unconfident. And Josh White, again, you know, he was a pro. And he saw this kid with eagerness in his bones. And that's 
what he fed me uh, was that feedback, like John Lee Hooker. And, you know, because I've been playing bluegrass, which has long been considered a white music, you know, and as my most, you know, sort of my home ground. But, you know, working in Jamaica with Jamaicans, working with uh, Flaco Jimenez and the Tex-Mex border music, and now recording in Hawaii with, uh, you know, Hawaiian players there, they all recognize the eagerness and commitment. And, you know, I think that eagerness and commitment and lack of, of expectations of anything, I think that's been my path of the Tao. Talking to Peter Rowan here on the Jake Feinberg Show. This is, we've done, th- this is our third or fourth interview and probably one of the most spiritually heavy. I, you know, going back to Ram Dass, uh, w- when he said you need to deal with with the race issue in our country, um, d- just for people out there that are listening and that are going to listen to this interview and they feel the same way, um, from a Dow point of view and from a true nature point of view and obviously just affecting change through who you are, um, I mean, has it been experiential learning in places like Jamaica or the fusing of African music with bluegrass or going to uh, Hawaii that is, that's, that's your contribution to addressing the race issue or how can people address this elephant in the room that continues to dog us that is, you know, part of our original sin of slavery and continues to dog us today, uh, in, in very, uh, uh, undignified ways. How, 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 what do you think Ram Dass really meant by that? And then how do people affect change in their own world, in your view? Well, I just think you have to be real in your world, you know, so that when you cross these imagined barriers, that, that you're, that you're you, you know, uh, it's not that difficult. Um, I don't think really, you know, be real into your world. And uh, and read. Come on, let's read. Let's look into the texts, the ancient texts. You know, they're not all outmoded by the latest technological innovation. You know, and uh, I, that's all I know, really. And because I'm in music, uh, which has you know the sense of the moment about it. You know, it's hard to write prose. You know, it's hard, it's difficult to sit down and, and write. It. Some of my happiest moments is writing. But the the moments that are my interaction with the world are performance of that private reflection. You know, so be real in your world. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of because, you know, keep widening your perspective. And I think the racist thing is, not racist it's just a there is a an in an in uh, bred phenomena of the world of chaos and confusion which we call samsara which is really our reaction to phenomena and, and racism or the divide between races is strong as a motif in um you know, everything from politics to personal relations but just be real in your world so when you meet people you meet them as you, you know, even if you're insecure, it doesn't matter. You know, you, you meet them with your best intentions. And that's why Ram Dass, I mean, Ram Dass is a wise man, but my personal interaction with him was only that one time. But again, people talk and they say, oh, yeah, that's that guy. You know, even in, in the reggae world, people have come up to me and told him, said, yeah, man, respect, you know, and, and it was, I thought, well, they're just reggae people. <laughs> but you know, the word, the, the word No, I mean, I mean, can you give an example if possible, uh, not in in this you know sort of more cultivated state that you're in, but at a time when you weren't being real in your world. See, I've been faking it for years. <laughs> <laughs> nice dodge, man. No, because I mean it's 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 like we. I'm kind of hung up on this thing, you know. It's like we all come from the original source. We all are one human race, and therefore racism, in my mind is not doesn't really exist it's more cultural bias and that's what people have to get over but it's you can say people read people read but you're going into like rural communities now places that that you and bill monroe used to play in and you either have you know big box stores uh huge heroin epidemics 
No oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, and what yeah. I'm, they're, what they're, they're not, yeah. they're not going beneath. They're not seeking. They have no ability to seek. Everything is. Oh, no, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. But what's happening is that, like local colleges nearby these these poverty stricken areas in the south, like local colleges are coming in and making that town a uh, uh, an object of development of the their latest ideas of the Habitat for Humanity type of approach i dig i was yeah i was just in venice and i went to the biennale exhibition on architecture in the world and and the the first part of the exhibition that i saw only that part was the state of where we are now but it touched on you know uh habitat and and how you accommodate the needs of people in large crowds that are going to be there like at, you know, on a giant pilgrimage in in india where there's 55 million people coming through this area over a two-week period on pilgrimage. So, uh, uh, the local yeah, no go, um, going back to the local. I want you to talk about this. The Habitat for Humanity. How is that a resource and a, and a shining light for these? Well, okay, there was a, one of these in one of the exhibits in in this um, in the Biennale exhibit in Venice was the rebirth of a southern town that you know had probably peaked in the cotton years, right? and ended somewhere in the 30s when cotton had destroyed the fertility of the ground and the slavery had de- uh, emancipation had de- uh, de- diffused and the the slave population who would have worked those fields you know yet they were all living locally in in uh, poor circumstances uh, so they took the bank building it was a nearby college that 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 Basically renovated the town. They made a made a community center uh, out of uh, some old b- barns, you know, maybe you know uh, that were part of the old downtown falling down. They took the bank. They made it into a library. You know, it was a failed town, it, right? Economically, uh, agriculturally depleted, and the the students engaged the town people, including the kids in the local classrooms black and white, you know, and said, this is the project. Let's make our town, let's make this town wonderful. And they've created farmer, farmer's markets. And, I mean, and, and part of the deal in the farmer's market was that you couldn't have a permanent structure, according to the town code, on, in this place where the market was going to be. So what they did was they fabricated portable uh, market stalls and every two weeks they bring them in on trucks and they set them up and the local townspeople are set up in the these wooden you know display stalls for the farmers market stuff innovating ways to approach a common experience that will unite people so like that you know yeah i dig no i mean it's i'm um talking to the to a musician and a healer uh just in uh you know i really hope we get a chance to connect uh when you're down here in southern arizona um yeah well i'm gonna play a bluegrass festival in a in a gambling casino and, and nothing Come be- on. i mean i mean beg 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 be- beg uh, uh, uh uh borrow a two nickels or a dime to call me on the phone you know let me let's get the money flowing and at the gambling casino for for peter rowan but um do well, you, I think you know that the future is in is in the educational systems, including everybody. And this musical mu- instrument museum, it's exactly that. It's it's the arts for the people, and it's, it's spacious, and there's a good crowd that's gathered, and and they're uh, interested, and the, the the sense of delight here. You know, I'm looking at a black couple walking over there, looking at some Chinese instruments, and then looking also. Uh, at some African instruments that's one of the musical journeys, uh, pathways of human movement. I mean, this is what we're talking about. Well, no, but I mean, music, that's what I want to, that's what I want to talk pathways. to you. I want to, I mean, can we all, can, can we, we read the texts? Uh, I interviewed Ahmad Jamal a few months ago. Um, oh my God. I'd love to hear that. Oh, you got to hear that. This is one of the, one of the most, le- but I mean, again, Peter, can we all say that, you know, we all are from the Red River Valley, that Africa is the motherland, that we you can trace our roots back to Africa? 
Well, that's what a lot of people will tell you. And um, isn't that where we, I, you know, I don't know. We're talking I'm asking you. I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm asking Peter Rowan about, you know, the. to me, it's like the first universities were, were in Africa. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you probably know more about that than I. Uh, now they're watching an African guy and taking pictures of the video. <laughs> Woo! The Dude, music, and I, you know, I was going to say. I mean, there's some. I mean, they they devote to every country the indigenous instruments of every country at the musical instrument museum. I yeah. mean, it really is a cool. It's a very trippy, cool place. Yeah. Hey, let's continue this, Jake. I'm, all right. I'm always willing to to talk. Uh, I'll let you go. I'd like to get a. Oh, I, I I came here with some folks in the. They're, they're the guests of uh, we're, we're the guests of the museum here. Sure, but um, yeah, you, you know, I don't see you know, I don't know how to wrap it up and say thus and then. You know, who knows? We only know an eon of our life here it, in the world. You know, we only know that maybe all these continents were one continent at one time. In which case, what does that mean to be from originally from Africa? It means to be from. South America and North America and East Africa, or does it mean to be from India and West Africa? You know what I mean? I'm looking at a map of the world here. It's pretty easy to see that it all fits together into a a whole, and then over time, the continental drift has, you know, taken us out. So I don't know where Africa. I don't know where Africa was. All right, yo. No. Listen, I'll I'll call you tomorrow. I really. uh, Can you get me backstage pass? I want to get some video of the of the band tomorrow. Uh, it's me alone. <laughs> it's you solo? Yeah. I'd, Special guest. I'd love to get back there tomorrow, man. All right. I'll call you tomorrow. All right, man. Be good. Much love. Thank you. Later. Bye-bye. Bye. Just another day at the office, another whistle stop uh, with Peter Rowan joining us from the Musical Instrument Museum in Phoenix, Arizona. It's a it's a place that if you haven't checked out and you live in Arizona, you ought to because you can spend the whole day there uh, just checking out. Uh, the world of music and uh, that's it for me we're going to rejoin the Jim Parisi show be back tomorrow with John Perry Barlow Steve Gadd Gerilyn Berdelius and Ozzy Ollers big day on the Jake Feinberg show for now that's it let's rejoin Jim Parisi what what my wife's on a channel I didn't even